Oh, and by the way, we'll be talking about your spouse <laughs> like, every single time. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, we can't have this conversation and not talk about the money conversations happening at home. I get so many men reaching out to me that want to talk about financial strategies and putting together, you know, a retirement income plan and stuff like that. And I say, I want your spouse at this meeting. And they're like, really? But she, she doesn't even want to think about money. And it's like, I don't care. I want her there at least to share her goals, her concerns, dream a little bit with me, what's on her bucket list, and then she can leave. Like, but I wanna hear from her perspective. If you've shared financial lives in any way, shape or form, even if you're not married, you should both be in the conversation. Hey guys, welcome to episode 120 of the Game On Girlfriend podcast. Today's guest is Amanda Neely. This was a really interesting conversation for me to have because it's all about feminism in money, when to pivot your business, and how to be a little bit still when it comes to creating financial decisions in your business and your personal life. Like, yes, please. <laughs> Just my favorite conversation. So Amanda Neely is both a small business owner and a financial professional. She owned the Overflow Coffee Bar with her husband for over 10 years, where they really looked at how to run this business and make the world a better place at the same time by using their financial gain to help social causes. So cool, right? Her story about how they figured out how to pivot that business is really important inside this episode. I really hope you listen for that. And I think they made a decision that absolutely not only saved their business in that moment, but actually helped them in the future with a really cool tale that you'll hear inside the episode. The other thing I hope you listen for is the importance of being a family unit when it comes to financial strategy and how we're saving, how we're spending, those sorts of things. I know this can be super touchy. I know. I've lived it. I watch my clients go through it. I'm sure you've experienced it. We all grow up with different ideas and, and we watch different examples of how money's spent and how it's saved and how we talk about it. And then we come together as family units and try to unify different ideas <laughs> can be really challenging. And when I asked her, what do people have to overcome in order to have these types of conversations? I think what she shared was really Great. In addition, we have a couple of things we mentioned in the episode. The one thing, it's a book, it's linked underneath here. And then also her still method. It's called the still method, right? So great. That's also linked below if you'd like to snag that. We need tools. It's important for us to understand that there's so many different avenues out there for us to learn. There's so many different ways for us to grow. And when there's a tool like this out there that someone's put together from their own experience, it can usually be pretty helpful. And she's offering that to us for free. So snag it. All right. Without further ado, let's get to it. Amanda, welcome to the Game on Girlfriend podcast. I'm like really happy you're here today. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Sarah. All the topics we're about to talk about are so near and dear to my heart, but can you just sort of tell us how did you get into this? Why do you love talking about this the way I love talking about this? Yeah, I never thought that I would ever in a million years be a financial professional. I actually started in the nonprofit sector. I've always been an activist. Yeah, I love to think of like, how do we make the world a better place? And so I started there, but slowly over time realized there's other ways to make the world better. Finding how we do financial work with people and how it make, gives them the ability to improve their lives, improve their immediate circle, as well as give more and make the world a better place because they're fulfilling their dreams. They're able to give more to charity, all those things. Mm. Just like, I'm making such a difference in the world. And that's all that really matters to me. So you talk about something that I just makes my socks roll up and down. And this is about bringing femininity into the conversation about money and finances. What is it about femininity and money and that connection that can make such a difference? It really comes down to seeing too many times where someone's on the other side, they're now a single woman, whether they're divorced or widowed, or it's been a couple years after making a pretty big financial decision. And even though they're with their um, male spouse, they're saying, I didn't know what was happening. When I talk with women that are in that space, it's like, well, how what, what happened before that you weren't included in the conversation that you didn't feel comfortable sharing your perspective and what was your perspective that you didn't get to share and bringing that out of them. What I find when women are allowed to uh, bring their voice, they're often the ones that are bringing, is this safe? Is this secure? How is this going to help our kids? How can I also like understand this, be active so I can make sure it's not just benefiting 
my spouse. It's not just benefiting the financial professional, but it's also benefiting me. Like what's in it for me too. And too often that just gets left out of the conversation. And so then the financial strategy ends up being more risky or doesn't factor in, well, what happens if maybe doesn't allow that woman to be her full self, right? In her full way that she wants to do that. Like she wants to have a a hobby or start a business that doesn't get in part of the financial plan. And so it never happens. And then it also matters when, if, and when a woman is on her own, that she knows exactly what is going to happen with her money and what to do there, not starting from scratch, but has already had lots of experience along the way. Oh my gosh. I think that's really important. You're reminding me of the moment I was wanting to start this business and I had two littles and like, I was still breastfeeding and I had weight to lose, but I had this amazing mind and I didn't want to stop using it, but I sure as heck didn't want to just see my kids in their pajamas, which is where I was. I was gone 12 hours a day and that was just did not work for me. And I remember kind of being worried about how I could have this financial conversation with my husband and be able to make this work without losing my, I want to say my seat at the table, right. As an equal earner, right. It was like, Hey, if I'm going to pull back and do this business, I'm not going to be making as much. Am I giving up my voice and being really like concerned about that? And I, I don't think I'm alone in that. Have you seen that as well as you work with people? So when I got married, I was 21. My husband was 28. He had the career. I was just out of college, right? I graduated a little early, right? And we didn't want to manage different bank accounts and like all the things. So we just merged everything together. And it was actually the smartest thing that I think we did because our income's been up. It's been down. It's been, you know, he's made more. I've made more. It's been all over the place. But because we had put it all together, we were having regular money meetings, talking about our money together, making decisions together. It hasn't mattered because it's all one bucket, whether it's the big financial decisions or the small budgeting decisions, everyone feels like they can bring their voice to that. And it, it's actually sometimes helpful to practice with the small decisions so that you can have that feeling when you're making the bigger decisions too. I love that. Yeah. And I do think it's, I mean, I've worked with clients, right. And I'm like, I'm so excited to work with you. Let's start your business. We work with what you need on a weekly yeah. basis based on where you are, where the business are, what's happening. Oh, and by the way, we'll be talking about your spouse <laughs> every single time. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, we can't have this conversation and not talk about the money conversations happening at home. Um, and I just am really excited to hear that more people are understanding that it doesn't matter how the money's coming into the family bank account. It matters how the family manages the money once it's there and that that is the family's money and understanding that. Um, and that's a paradigm shift for a lot of people, I think. Yeah. It was like, yeah. that's my money. I earned that. Or it can appear right. that way at first. Have you found that as well? Oh yeah. I get so yeah. many men reaching out to me that want to talk about financial strategies and putting together, you know, a retirement income plan and stuff like that. And I say, I want your spouse at this meeting. And they're like, really? But she, she doesn't even want to think about money. And it's like, I don't care. I want her there at least to share her goals, her concerns, dream a little bit with me, what's on her bucket list, and then she can leave. Like, but I want to hear from her perspective. If you have shared financial lives in any way, shape or form, even if you're not married, you should both be in the conversation. All right. Everybody listening. I don't care where you are or who you are or what just, could you please remember that? (laughs) Like no matter what's happening, both people should be involved in any financial meeting. I think that's brilliant. I, I mean, we've all seen it. I think we all probably know someone too, who was suddenly, the only person left for whatever reason. And, and that happens in so many different ways, especially for women. But that idea of like, I don't know where, I don't know where the financial statements are. I don't know what the financial statements are. And it's devastating. It's not like, this is a nice to have conversation. This is like really, really important. What do you think people have to overcome for themselves to really understand the importance of this and to understand why this isn't a like my money, your money conversation, but this is a, here's where everything is conversation and why that's so important. What do you think people actually have to overcome to be able to do that? Well, so I'm going to talk from both perspectives, whether it's the person that's in control that doesn't see why the other person needs to be there, or if it's the person that's not involved in the conversation is like, why should I be? I'll do the second one first. What I hear a lot is one that good with numbers. I don't like to think about money. I don't like to think about the what ifs. And it's just like, it's not that complicated. 
if you can add and subtract, right? That's all you need to do. You don't need to know complex algebra. And if there is a financial professional that's kind of talking above your head, then you need to call them out on it and say, can you yes. say that in layman's terms? Yes. Can you say that again in a different way? Can you give me an example? Having some of those scripts that um, help challenge that financial professional to be a better of service to you, right? They work for you. <laughs> they should right. be able to do those things. Right. And also, and if they won't find somebody different, right? Make sure you're hiring the person for you. And also with your spouse, it could be also, they kind of talk where it seems like above your head or they make it too complicated. Use those same scripts for them too, right? The people that you surround yourself with should be empowering you and saying, you can do it. Is there also an embarrassment factor, you think? Like a fear of like, they're going to know, I don't know. Yeah, that's exactly why we need those kind of scripts. That's saying, I understand, but I want to understand more. And Mm -hmm. that's actually like, uh, that puts you in a good light rather than saying, I don't understand. What about the person who's in control? Like recognizing that two, two heads are better than one, that there could be a day when I'm not here that this person is going to need to take over. And so realizing the importance uh, that some of those factors and re- like relinquishing a little bit of control can help, but also writing an I love you statement. It's really just what you picture of a statement of net worth and you write at the top instead of net worth statement, you write, I love you. Oh and you can gosh. even put a cover letter over it. That's like, dear spouse, here's a statement of where everything is. You can do this, you know, like, and doing that as if you had just passed away. Right. And you're, right. you're, ha- you have that in a, a desk drawer or a safety deposit box or, you know, somewhere where your spouse would know where it is. Even taking that step then shows maybe I could say some of these things today, seeing it all in black and white, seeing it from that perspective of, I love this person. Mm. I want them to have a good life. Even if I'm not around, what, it, what needs to happen to make sure that that's true. Right. It actually, instead of it being a source of stress or anxiety or fighting, it can actually be a source of of deeper connection. I want to pivot for a second (laughs) and talk about (laughs) how people know when it's time to pivot in their own businesses. Back in 2011, my husband and I opened the doors to an independent social on, uh, enterprise coffee shop in downtown Chicago. We you know, ran out of savings. We'd been living just on tips from the tip jar, mm. right? We had mm. to like come full force with, if this is gonna work for the long term, we needed to make some changes because if this business didn't work for us, it didn't matter how many other people it helped. We started actually like figuring out how do we pay ourselves a living wage? How do we maybe set aside something for the long-term retirement, but keep it available in case we need it for the business? And we had a flood in the business and we had to close for a while. But thankfully we had this side bucket of money that we could use. You were able to do that by tiny incremental savings. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. We were thinking like the way that we're living life now, This is not how we want to raise our kid. Let's explore options. We had had the vision for a long time. We're going to do this business. We're going to retire from this business. And it shifted to being, this doesn't align with actually how we want this little guy to be raised and the experience we want him to learn and see what running a business is really like. And it was that shift that showed us it was time to pivot. And ultimately, because we made those financial changes, it was it made it really easy to sell the business. So it actually ended up serving everything that you guys checked in with yourselves, looked at wasn't at what wasn't working and, and started to tweak it a little bit. All of you listening who have businesses, when you have those months, which every business has, right? You're okay. Nothing's mm-hmm. wrong. It happens to every single business that it doesn't mean like it's catastrophe. It doesn't mean it's time to close. It might be time to actually investigate, right? And sort of look. But I just think what you guys did was brilliant in figuring out small ways to tweak that in the long term ended up making a huge change. And I guess that is kind of the whole deal with money, right? It doesn't have to be dramatic, but it needs to be consistent. Well, this reminds me of something I think that you do that's very cool. Um, And I think you call it the still method. And I'd love to know just a little, a lot more probably, um, but a little bit more about this. Still is an acronym. S stands for set your sights. Let's remember where we're going 30 years from now. What our five year, you know, what's our goal for this year? It gets us really like revved up, excited. And then the T is track your in and out. Actually look at what's come in lately. What's gone out lately. For some people, this looks like budgeting. For us, it's we, it's a little different budgeting. It's mostly just like cash flow, right? What's come in, what's gone out, noticing what's happening there. Um, how do we feel about it? 
And then the I is inspect your progress. So you look at your goals, you see the um, you know, what's come in and what's gone out and you see like, how are we doing? Let's measure, mm-hmm. you know, are we getting closer where we want to go? Do we take a step backward? And then the first L is look for the 1% adjustment, look for the little tweak that can help make, put you better, you know, toward that progress, right? What's mm-hmm. the, the thing that needs to come in or the thing you need to stop going out or, um, how do we, um, make, you know, change our focus a little bit. And then the final L is to live deliberately, actually do the 1% thing, um, make it happen over um, the next week or two weeks or the month, how, you know, however long yeah. you need to make that happen. And then you come back and you repeat it again. We do it once a month, the last Saturday of the month, because it gives us, you know, looking back over the, la- the last month, how yeah. things really gone, what do we want to shift in the month coming up? We get to play the CFO and the CEO. And remember, it's not just about money. It's also about where the business is going and yeah. kind of wrestle around with that a little bit. And it's, it ends up being a lot of fun. We always try to add um, our vice is coffee. So we get like a nice mocha or something like that. <laughs> Other people do ice cream or even wine, you know, like to make it Love even it. You know, funner that way too. You said something really great, which is actually implementing (laughs) the 1% change. You know, I found that too. Like when I'm like, I think I need a raise, right? It's really hard to say that when you see how many things your business needs, right? It's like, yeah, but things are, things are developing here, or we need to make sure we can do X, Y, Z. And it's like making those, and they're usually very tiny, small adjustments, but making those adjustments inside the business can be really challenging, right? I mean, it takes some some courage and some discipline to get that done. Yeah. I lean on the one thing by Gary Keller. Do you know that method? And anytime we're like, what is the 1% adjustment? What, what, you know, we've got this 10 things we could do. Which one do we want to focus on this month? I go straight to his method to be like, Mm. what's the one thing that if we do it is going to make everything else unnecessary or easier. So if you guys have not read that book, oh my gosh, go get it. Go get it. Amanda's totally right. It's brilliant. So great. Oh, well, Amanda, it has just been so great chatting with you today. And I know that you have your still method available for our listeners and watchers. Um, Can you tell us a little bit more about that? It's pretty simple. Stillmethod.com. And you go there, you can download a checklist. It's easily printable. We made it like white background and everything. So you can print it out or have it on an iPad or, you know, wherever and bring it to your money meeting. And it's really just a list of questions with space to maybe even fill in answers or copy them over into your journal or even just open up the conversation and see where it leads. So it's meant to just help have that conversation. And I, we applied it to business, but you can also use it for personal finance too right? What are your goals personally? How are things going, tracking in and out? Um, are you re- reaching your financial goals? What's your progress? And what 1% adjustment do we need to make this month in terms of our grocery budget or, um, or it, how we increase our income, you know, here or there, those kind of things. Oh, that's awesome. You guys definitely make sure you grab that. I figure, you know, when it comes to money, so many of us are always working to heal our relationship to money and to figure out like, I get that question a lot, like, but what do I do? <laughs> and I feel like you've really given an answer to that, which is so fantastic. So you guys, if you've been in that position or you felt that way, please go check this out. We always love when we have experts on the show who, you know, can actually push your life forward a little bit. That's always such a bonus. So please go snag that. Um, like I said, the link will be under this video. Amanda, thank you again for being here today. It's just been awesome talking to you. I think this is so important. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. It's my pleasure. Um, I, I love sharing this concept with people because it's helped me so much and I'm starting to hear where it's helping other people too. Oh, the best, the best.